Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome everybody to the uh, March 9th. I can't believe it's already March, March 9th question and answer. Uh, we do have only a couple questions, but we have a little bit of a presentation and want to go through uh, with everybody here. And again, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm going to share my screen here. I'm going to take my video off and go through this brief presentation. We'll go over all the questions that, that people did uh, submit. So stay tuned one second. So I wanted to start off uh, tonight first and talk a little bit about the strategic plan. It's just going to be a little bit. We use the acronym REACH, which you'll actually see later on as well with another acronym. Uh, but this is Responsibility, Equity, Academics, Communications, and health, but really when we look at equity, it's equity, diversion, diversity, and inclusion, academics, communication, and health and safety. So every single thing that you see us put out, you'll see the strategic plan embedded in so many of the things that we do. Whether or not you actually see it on a document or not, know that every single thing we do is tied to the, the strategic plan. And there's every aspect of the strategic plan is viewed through the lens of equity. We know that as we transition on, we have to do that. That is critical. And that's why I'm so glad that the Board of Education had great input in this. We had the community that great input, staff, teachers, administration, students. It's really has been a beautiful, authentic collaborative effort. I mentioned earlier, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Women's History Month. And earlier today, I, well, actually every day, uh, Monday, Monday through Friday, and then on the weekends, I do a little bit of research, but Monday through Friday, I put a quote out earlier in the morning, sometimes really early, other times a little bit later. With the tagline though, hashtag contributing 365. And so when you look at any type of history month, Last month was Black History Month. This month, Women's History Month. The contributions don't just stop in this case, Women's History in the, in the month of March. I think about the, the great work that my mother did and certainly you know, outside of you guys hearing me talk about my mom, you would not know anything about her. Uh, but I think my mom made history where she was at Ursuline College and the great work that she did there. And there's a nice little memorial of her uh, with the tree and, and the impact that she had on Ursuline College and the great work that's done, we know it just doesn't happen in just one month. So to all the women out there uh, making history and doing great things, thank you so much for the contributions. And we know that women have certainly played a huge, I mean, our history is all about recognizing and appreciating so many people, uh, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, religion, that we need to embrace that each and every day. Speaking of that, last night at the board meeting, we recognized, uh, did a proclamation, a resolution, excuse me, to talk about this month being Music in Our Schools Month. And at Princeton, the theme is music, the sound of my heart. And you know already about the great music tradition we have here. And the fine arts in general are just absolutely amazing here. We know that that's critical to develop the whole child. And so again, uh, we so appreciate the great contributions, but again, you know, music does, just doesn't happen in March. It happens each and every day at Princeton. Something else that happens each and every day is great work that's done by our operations staff in one aspect of food distribution. And so you see there's so many different aspects of that we're still doing and we will continue to do that. We know that, you know, the, and I know it's well over this right now, 350,000 meals that have been served and distributed that we need to continue to do that and continue to uh, work with community partners to distribute food, to help eliminate some of the, the, the food deficit we know that exists. One of the things just wanted to draw your attention to is that this Thursday, uh, we'll do our second round with the majority of our staff, second round, 
with staff vaccinations. So again, you know, this Thursday and Friday are remote learning days. So more to follow on that, but just a little aside for those that haven't gotten the second shot, if you're doing Moderna or Pfizer, we do Moderna, the second shot. There was a, um, I had that last Friday. And for me, I had some soreness, fatigue, and was very fortunate that, that that was it. That was the only side effect. But I know now that I'm protected against, not against COVID, because I could still get COVID, but protected against really the, the, the damaging effect that COVID can have on, on people and on a person, so to speak. Uh, we do know that some other people, you know, it, it varies. Unfortunately, you know, we've, we've heard stories about people that have had some pretty severe reaction and, and the side effects uh, chills, uh, body aches, fever, and so forth. So hopefully if you're getting that second shot, you don't experience that. Uh, one of the things they say that helps with that is right after the, the shot, if you take uh, Tylenol, uh, but I would check all the guidelines and all that to make sure that, that um, that's okay with your doctor and your medical plan if you have that. But uh, we certainly hope that there's no issues with that. As I mentioned, the calendar reminder, so March 11th and 12th are virtual learning days for all students. Uh, just as a reminder, we're gonna spring forward on March 14th, so we're gonna lose an hour. And then March 15th, great day at Princeton. Man, we are so excited to welcome back Scarlet and Gray learning students together. And so uh, we're, it's gonna be a great day. It's gonna be nice. We you still are requiring masks. Still sanitize as much as we can. We see the numbers are going down, but we still need to be vigilant. As you know, we're still going to have the same hours of operation as we've had the entire school year. So that has not changed. We're going to do uh, some type of work with uh, some catch up with some students. So stay tuned for more information on that. But again, the lunch operations, we've really done a lot with that. Uh, this is a big item for us right now. Uh, some of you uh, may not have ever seen or heard of final forms. Uh, and we put it out a lot of different places, but we know that we need to make sure that everybody signs up and goes through final forms, check your medical records, your emergency medical form, any type of documentation and all that. We, you, you're gonna need to do that every single person. So we'll continue to pound this information out. So again, stay tuned for more information, but please make sure if you just go to our website, www.princetonschools.net, you'll see information on this and please make sure you sign up and uh, complete all the forms. You know, one of the things we talked about early on this year is the fact that we know that we're gonna need to do some additional work to help students uh, kind of eliminate this COVID gap, the learning gap, if you will. And so our summer programs, and we have a bunch, but we're very thrilled to offer the Little Bike Summer Camp and the program that we're gonna do. We're gonna look at enrichment activities. We're gonna provide breakfast and lunch. We're going to transport if needed. We're going to do that. So again, uh, some students will be, and parents will be told that your child has to attend, needs to attend. Uh, others, it may be voluntary. And you can do that, but we have to be serious about the learning gap. And I know summer, I understand that, but quite frankly, we have to be serious about the academic growth of our children. And if you get a phone call from a principal or teacher saying that really needs your son at summer school, that's it, they need to be there. And so when you look at some of the times and all that, and again, you'll be able to get all that information. You're gonna, we're gonna be okay, but we have to have great attendance to help close this COVID learning gap. In the middle school, we're gonna do a summer bridge camp, which you've done before. The summer school itself, we're gonna do again, so much support with a heavy academic focus on, on the, the core academic, but we're also gonna provide, if you go back here to the camp, some enrichment and camp activities from 12 to three. And when you look at the summer school itself, again, we're gonna provide transportation. We're gonna do every single thing that we can, again, to really eliminate this, this COVID gap. And at the high school, you see it's gonna be 7.30 to 11.30.
We are going to have a specialized program for ninth graders, incoming ninth graders. And we're also going to provide PE and health courses. Those will be available as well as other courses, not only for credit recovery, but some exploratory opportunities as well. Just wanted to mention and say thank you to all those parents who stepped up, especially those at last minute. I have to tell you, uh, we were told earlier on, I said we could raise up to $50,000 through this express feedback for good. I really pushed on some people. Uh, I'm <laughs> put on Facebook, Instagram, man, we had it all over the place. Our district site, everywhere, emails, phone calls, and you guys all stepped up. And in fact, so much so the company agreed to give us more than what they even agreed to initially. So $55,000 going to be used for our students with social emotional learning, with mental health and summer school support. So thank you so very much. And by the way, we've been penciled in already for next year. So get your fingers ready because we're going to need it next year as well. You know, all throughout COVID, one of the things we've learned is that we're still offering these different opportunities for students. Student voice is critical. All through COVID, we know that we just can't offer the bare minimum at Princeton. That's not the Princeton advantage. So we collaborated with school districts from across the country and four of our students will be presenting at the C Summit, which will be April 24th. And this is professional development for, te for teachers, for us all, really. It's all designed and led by students. So it's going to be April 24th. And for us, it's going to be 11 to 3. So again, uh, stay tuned for more information, but it's going to be fantastic. Very quick reminder, <laughs> uh, we have a save the date for the Princeton Golf Outing. More information is going to be forthcoming about that. But more importantly, the C Summit. So if you have a choice to do one of the two, please do the C Summit. Our kids have worked very hard for unbelievable students and they're gonna represent Princeton, but they're gonna represent first themselves, their family, the community they live in. It's going to be amazing. And just a quick shout out to our, our Princeton Pride, or Pride of Princeton marching band. If you haven't had an opportunity to vote, please make sure you do so. Just go to our website We've been nominated USA Today High School Sports Awards Cincinnati. So please make sure you go vote for Princeton. You can do it once a day. Join me in voting once a day for the Pride of Princeton Marching Band to be the best band around. So we already know that's the case. Let's just get it in USA Today. Later on tonight, 645, same place. You don't have to leave here. Same Facebook Live. Coping with stress. Dr. Kate Shard, we certainly appreciate her uh, expertise. This is going to be great. We know that these times are stressful. Times are so different, unique, for sure. It is really, really important to make sure that we understand the very nature of what we can do to help understand the stressors, understand ultimately how do we cope with stress? What are some mechanisms we can use? So when Dr. Shard comes on at 645, uh, stay tuned. I, I'm going to introduce it very quickly, and then we're going to jump right into the program like we've done before. Again, this uh, parent uh, community educational series, we actually talked about this not too long ago. And many people, actually, I was talking to somebody yesterday, uh, a big funder, who is looking at providing opportunities for Princeton. And when asked, what have you done for the parents and the community? We talked about this. They're like, they haven't even heard about this. Now I know many other schools do something similar and certainly appreciate the great work that all, all the other school districts do, but the diversity of offerings and what we do for parent and community through this educational series has been amazing. So certainly appreciate all those people uh, that work behind the scenes to make that, this happen. And, and especially Trisha Roddy, who this is really kind of her brainchild and certainly appreciate the great work that she does as well. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to go, I'm going to go back. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. I'm going to go back and 
and answer some questions that we have in a document. So as I've done uh, with all of our Q and A's, whether it's been staff or parents, I'm just going to read the questions. And uh, again, the, the information that we have here will be available for everybody. So the first question is, when will students get ACT test scores back from tests they took on March 3rd? Are there other tests students should be taking if they're planning to go to college? Well, ACT uh, test results typically come back in April specifically based upon this. Normally, there's uh, about a six week time period. Uh, and, and hopefully if I'm uh, maybe a little bit off on that, but I think it's typically six weeks that the results come back in. But when those results come back and we'll make sure that we distribute those for sure. Now we do know that last year it took a little bit longer because of the pandemic, but trust us, as soon as we get the information, we'll let you know. Regarding any other, any other uh, test that students should be taking, the SAT is still offered as well. Uh, now for the seniors this year, a lot of them, a lot of the colleges have waived the ACT. They're just looking for an SAT. They're just looking specifically at the, the grades, the school that kids are coming from, the activities and the complete application minus the, the scores. Now, uh, regarding any other tests and all that, I always think that every night, now the students that are listening may not necessarily like this, but I think it's important for kids that, that want to go to college should do some type of ACT prep, even if it's just reading a question or two at night. I think that's really important. Uh, I think even more than that, maybe a, a, a one of the sec sections of, of the ACT that could be doing each and every night. There's always work to do to get better, that's for sure. Second question is, will there be a traditional prom? If not, uh, will an alternative plan be made? So it's interesting because just today, the governor said that uh, there's dancing allowed. Uh, it kind of felt a little bit like uh, Footloose uh, when they finally realized that dancing is okay. Uh, but there are certain restrictions. And again, we're going to proceed methodically with all of our plans for not only prom, but also graduation. I'll talk about graduation here in a second. So go back to prom. The Board of Education last night approved the contract for prom. Now we're moving ahead, making sure that we're taking care of all everything we can. We need to make sure it's safe. We're going to follow all the guidelines and the masks are going to need to be worn. As of right now, they're going to need to be worn. And if they're not, then, you know, we're going to have to, you know, react accordingly. So please uh, stay tuned for more information. We'll give it to you for sure. Uh, will there be a traditional graduation ceremony? You know, if you're like me, and I think just about everybody is like me on this one, we need traditional graduation. We need to see our kids, the great work that they did. The, I mean, it's, it's not just a student graduation. It is a family, it is a community. It's, it's amazing. And so we hope to be able to have our students walk across the stage at Fifth Third Arena. Right now, there's been no adjustments that have been made in, in uh, the, um, the, excuse me, I, I, I'm sorry, uh, how many students and parents and fans, so to speak, will be allowed to go into the arena. They have not changed that. We're still waiting for more guidance from them. But once we do that, we'll let you know how many people are allowed to go. And hopefully we'll be able to be on the, be on the gymnasium floor down there at Fifth Third Arena and walking across the stage and having some sense of traditional graduation. We would love to see that. However, I will tell you this, I did talk to the high school staff today, uh, the administration and uh, Mr. Balmer, who does a great job as high school principal, Don Stollard, associate, principal and 
Mr. Walker, Mr. Wade, Mr. Newton, all the guidance counselors, they're looking at alternative uh, graduation venues, what we can do, how we can do it. So the goal is to have graduation and being able to see the kids walk across the graduation stage, the commencement, it's always such a beautiful event. But again, stay tuned for more information. When will, when and how will uh, we get notified if our child is recommended to be part of after school program? So elementary middle school students will receive a permission slip and communication from teachers or principals by this Friday. Now, if you know that your son or daughter is not doing well, they need to come to after school. So whether or not you get that or not, you need to advocate for them to be there. The same goes for summer school. Regarding high school, all high school students needing academic support are encouraged to stay for support. An activity bus will be provided for transportation home. If your child is struggling in any course, please encourage them to stay. Or as I like to say, and if my son's listening, he know this is the way it would be, I would tell him to stay. You guys are the parents, the guardians, the grandparents. You need to advocate for your child and you need to be the adult and say, you need to stay after school, that's it. Uh, we need to take this learning seriously as I talked about before. I know I can be pretty hard or firm on this, but the fact of the matter is, um, you know, raising kids, it's not a democracy. And we need to make sure that we push our students, our children to be the best that they could be. And if they don't take advantage of all these opportunities, and we know that they're not doing well academically, they're not taking advantage of those opportunities. And then just to kind of in conclusion, if you're not notified by Friday, but would like additional support, please contact your child's teacher, counselor, building principal. Uh, this is why are, why are kids still going half a day? Why can't they go back full time? So it's not half a day. It's when we look specifically at the time that was taken, this is all gone around because of the capacity of the high school. So when you look at the high school, middle school, if you guys remember the high school, middle school cafeterias are basically connected, but there's a big wall that can go in between, but because of, because of spacing and all that, and we wanted to make sure social distancing from the beginning, we had to change our whole schedule. We had to change so many different aspects. We had to roll with that big punch. Quite frankly, we would have had to reconstruct our entire schedule to accommodate for everybody coming back full time. We couldn't do it. There's no way we would have been able to do it. When you think of, when you think of the amount of work that's done, many kids, you know, you've already started scheduling for next year. Think about that. It's February, March. Actually, counselors start talking about it in January. So, and you don't even start school till August. So think about the, the great work that has to be done to make sure that schedules are, are really tight and there are no issues. And still, even if that's the case, we know that every once in a while there still may be some hiccups. So please make sure, please make sure that we have, uh, that you guys uh, advocate uh, for your, your sons and daughters, and just know that we're advocating for them each and every day. And if we could, we would come back completely 100% full-time, uh, full schedules, but we will be back in action uh, in August. All right, so there's a couple other questions, so very quickly, and uh, I appreciate the, the, the nice nature of this. And for those who don't see me on camera, it's probably better anyway that you don't see me, but uh, I was told that you could hear me, which is much more important. So forgive me if this is already covered, but are virtual students going back to school building this year? No, unless you want to. Students whose parents chose at-home learning for the full year will not be returning this school year. And, and what I mean is, what I should have said is, you're not coming back because of the choice. And again, when you look at some of those things, um, we could not, there's no way that we could say, 
You guys could come back if you want. And this is what we found out. In almost every single case when someone chose remote learning, they did it because of a health condition that they had, their child had. They did it for other, for other reasons. And so that's why we're holding tight saying that uh, students whose parents chose at-home learning for the full year will not be returning to school this year. Now, another question came up, can fully remote students attend summer school? That answer is yes, you can. And I think for many of our kids who have done that, if you feel it's safe and you feel comfortable, and it is safe, but if, you've, if you're comfortable, then you should have your son or daughter come to school at summer school to kind of get them back in the flow. I think that's really important, actually. And what were the times for summer school for elementary students? Is it all summer? No, it's July 1st through July, excuse me, June 1st through July 1st, 8.30 to 12. Again, June 1st through July 1st, 8.30 to 12. And again, stay tuned for additional uh, opportunities that may be popping up even before, before summer. And again, it is all of our responsibility. Every one of our students has connectivity. And again, if you don't have that, please reach out and let us know. We've been over backwards to communicate, but we know that everyone's busy. So people may have missed that, but everybody has connectivity and devices. So we should be checking emails every single day. Parents, checking emails every day. Students, checking emails every day. There's gonna be wonderful opportunities that will be created that we don't even know of right now, but we know it's Princeton. And the Princeton advantage is making sure that we have opportunities that are going to advance our students to levels previously unknown. Last night at a board meeting, we recognized Jill Phillips, who is a leader in leading Viking basketball history for wins. We heard Maria Linhart do a beautiful piano solo. It was amazing. And Dia Patel was recognized as Rotary Student of the Month. But her words and what she said about she would not be where she is today without Princeton. Basically, that's a mic drop, folks. She would not be where she was without Princeton. We hear that all the time. And we are not perfect. But if you take advantage of the opportunities that exist, if you work hard, if you stay informed as a parent, a guardian, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, if you stay informed of the opportunities, if you push, your child will be more successful and will reach levels previously unknown. So we're gonna give one more minute or two to see if there's any other questions. And I am going to, I'm going to take a, a minute right now and just say that, you know, this pandemic uh, is horrific. And I was asked today by Channel 9 about, you know, things we learned from the pandemic. And there's people that we know of, many people that talk about, boy, through this pandemic, we've learned a lot. We've grown a lot. There's a lot of positives. Uh, I can't even talk about that without saying like all the lives that were lost, it's hard to try to find positives. There have been positives though, but you have to pay homage to the lives that are lost, the families that are forever gonna be changed, people that will forever be changed. Now we've grown a lot, we've learned a lot, but today I talked about it should not have taken COVID to further illustrate the importance of eliminating the digital divide, which we have at Princeton. It should not have taken COVID to illustrate the great food need that exists in our communities. There's so many aspects of it should not have taken COVID to illustrate it. But we know that for us to grow, uh, we need to try to find ways that we can get better and that's what we've done over COVID, through COVID. I think that when we go back full time, you're going to see learning modules, learning models that are going to be unbelievable 
They're going to be continue. That's going to push the edge. And that's what we want to do. We will offer some type of remote option. Now we're still working with the legislators on what that will look like, but we are going to offer some type of remote or virtual. And we already kind of do that a little bit, but it is going to be dynamic and we're going to continue to push the envelope the best that we possibly can. So it's 645. Uh, it's actually 646 right now. So doc, Dr. Shard, Dr. Shard, uh, certainly appreciate uh, you being here. So happy to be here. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to let Dr. Shard introduce herself and talk a little bit about, but this coping with stress is so absolutely critical. And for those people that may have put in questions the last minute, Stay tuned, uh, just go to the comment section and you'll see those, those questions that are answered. And again, if you have questions afterwards, please make sure you just email us. And in fact, we'll put some emails down in the chat right now and you can uh, just make sure you cut and copy those, email any questions to those, those email addresses. We'll make sure we get answers to you right away. But thank you for tuning in. And of course, as always, go Vikes. Dr. Shard, it's all you. Thank you. And as we're all in the era of COVID, as am I, um, sitting in a, in a parking lot at a soccer field, which I wasn't planning on doing tonight, but uh, everyone's uh, plans change on the rapid. So forgive me for that. Um, but I'm Kate Chard. I am the director of the UC Health Stress Center at the University of Cincinnati, and I run all of the post-traumatic stress programs at the VA. So what I do is stress. Um, and I talk with a lot of people about managing stress, handling stress, and working through stress. And of course, one of the biggest things we've dealt with for a solid year is stress. So I'm happy to be here to answer questions, to um, kind of talk through stress, but let me just pause there with my introduction and then I'll uh, take it away with whatever you want me to cover tonight. So thanks for having me. That, Dr. Shard, I think I think the biggest question that people really think about and that's that's on their mind and one of the things that we've talked a lot about is we know like there's all these stresses that that hit us, not only just in general, but especially with COVID, like about the vaccine. What does that mean? Uh, you know, there's still research that needs to be done. So can you talk just in general, maybe with right away some specific steps that we could follow to kind of help us process all the different information that's flowing at us and so that we don't feel as stressed? Absolutely, so there's some key things I'd like to, to focus on right off the bat is you can actually make your stress worse by getting too much media. Um, and so I think a lot of us want to be informed and that's very important, but I always tell folks, limit the time. There's nothing that major that's happening in society that won't come up as an instant feed on your phone or the six people who are encountering you in the next six hours. So tagged on Facebook or Instagram or any other options who tend to be high stress, high anxiety people. You know what? Maybe don't look at their posts all the time because they may not be the most helpful for you. And the truth is, yes, there are news sources that definitely want to spin things in one direction or another. As someone who's done a lot of press, I can tell you, I can see one news story I do going one station and going another if I do the other one. I get it. Find news station motivated and maybe more science motivated, fact motivated, whatever, whatever you need to feel calm and go with those news outlets instead of those that maybe are trying to get more viewers. And when you go for those types of outlets, there's less from them. But e e even if you want to say, don't get me wrong, if you like a Facebook feed or a certain news station, that's fine, but 
just limit it to not all day. Don't turn it on at record anxiety. Instead of making us feel necessary, make our Susie or Joe or John down the street are doing, but what's right for you and the people that you love. And if we follow those decisions, it, it does help to decrease our stress quite a bit. Because so often I think we get caught up in, look at what this person down the street is doing in any direction about the vaccine or about socializing or even about how they're raising their kid. And as long as it's not directly affecting you, try to leave that at the door when you walk home at night so you can be present with your own family and enjoy the time you have instead of focusing on what they are or are not doing that maybe doesn't fit with your values and your morals. And the more we can do that, the more we can go to bed at night and get better sleep. And, and I have to highlight this. If, if I, I say anything tonight that you take home with you is that sleep matters. Sleep is the most restorative thing we have for helping us function to helping us deal with stress. And so many people, unfortunately, are doing things that are not good for sleep. So first of all, caffeine, caffeine six hours before bed, we've got to get caffeine out. And I know I, all my life, I've heard people say, I can drink a pot of coffee before I go to sleep at night. Yeah, you can, but you actually don't hit Delta restorative sleep then. And if we don't hit restorative sleep, we don't function as well. We don't get as much done. So get the caffeine down. If you have a TV in the bedroom, uh, please try to move it, turn it off. Don't use it at night. Um, it's one of the worst ways for inducing uh, sleep problems, but also the volume changes with commercials and with TV shows, and it actually inhibits sleep because you're focused on it. So it's really important that we try to do things that are going to help us sleep better throughout the evening. So reducing noise, getting a white noise maker, not using a TV, getting the cell phones away from our bedroom if at all possible a few minutes before bed. Are all things for reducing stress. And then just remember self-care. Uh, Dr. Shard, if I could jump in, I so apologize. Things your, your throughout the day, on the weekend, when you're not working. Kids that you can do them with even better joy as a family that you haven't been able to do for the last. And then get information instead of maybe disparaging them. How's that? Are you still there? Yeah, so the video, yeah, the video is up, but that's okay. I think the audio is better now. Okay, good, good. No, I, I, so I was just saying, and, and just remember to practice that self-care with your family. And when you get news sources, just remember to get them from reliable places so that when it comes to the vaccine and whether you should get it or not, you know, just remember some of the things that we do know about um, the vaccine is it's no different than the flu vaccine and other vaccines that we've given our children all our lives. These are things that have saved lives for years and years and years. And Cincinnati has been a pioneer historically in the creation of vaccines that we've been using for the last hundred years. I think I saw a question come up in the chat. Did you catch that, Tom? Yes, the question was, um, what are some of the strategies to deal with the feelings of isolation? Well, what a great question. I think everyone is tired of both isolation and Zoom calls all at the same time, right? Um, we we want to talk to people. We want to talk to people in person. And the new guidance from the CDC is wonderful that if we've been vaccinated, we actually can move towards spending more time with people. So I realize the vaccine isn't available for everyone, but in Ohio, it just dropped down to 50 years old. So we're moving in the right direction. And the faster we can get everyone vaccinated, we can start socializing is just Wonderful. So please, you know, follow the vaccine rules and, and the guidance that we're getting from the states, um, but being able to do that. But also, don't forget ways that we used to be able to socialize. I mean, I think back to the days when we've had um, soldiers that used to go off to war um, for, for years and years, not just for tours that lasted several months, but people that were gone for a long time, people that had jobs that took them away for a long time, and we didn't have cell phones, and we didn't have um, a live chats and all of these things. You know, write a letter to someone that you care about. There's nothing more fun than going to the mail and receiving a card or a note or a letter or a postcard. And then maybe they'll do it back with you. And it's a nice way to stay in touch, just little things like that. 
I know a lot of people who are actually playing games online now. So if you're going to use online, why not make it more fun instead of just doing a Zoom call, which you might find, you know, you're tired of and you don't want to do, you know, what about playing a game like Scrabble or Wordplay or even just doing something together online? There's a lot of games that they've now integrated where you can actually play them together with your family online all at the same time. Um, I know someone the other day was playing a game of trivia online with their entire family. They had six different screens going and they were doing trivia and they said it was a blast because it got everyone involved, but it wasn't just one person going, well, what have you all been doing and what have you all been doing? Um, so getting us connected. One of the things I recommend strongly for teenagers, if they're not into gaming and connecting over gaming, allowing your teenagers or you're even into the, the tweeners to watch a movie with their friends. Have the movie online and have a cell phone or iPad right next to them where they can be laughing at the same jokes. They can be talking at the same time. And it's almost as if we're back in a movie theater again and they can pretend that they're with their people again. And these are wonderful ways for us to, to reconnect. I mean, we know the dramatic impact of all of this isolation on our students. It's, it's terrible. And what we know is it's also hard for the adults. So doing what we can to connect our children together Yes, spring sports are starting. That's wonderful, but it's it's still risky. And so we can't maybe have that social hour. So what can I do to have my kids still socialize with their friends, even if I'm having to use, you know, electronics in order to do it? I think these are some of the steps we need to do that are a little bit out of the box. Great suggestion. And a lot of the streaming services are now offering the watch parties where um, even the persons that are watching this, you don't have to have subscriptions. So I'm definitely writing that one down as one of the options. We've got another question here from our Facebook Live. How do you reassure our kids that they will, will, they will feel safe with everyone returning to class, which means their exposure could be greater? You know, I think that's a great question. And I love that some of the children are thinking about that because they're aware of what's going on. Society. And I think you have to take that the same way that you know, hurricanes and tornadoes in different parts of the world. Um, and also when we've had things, un unfortunately, with school shooters and, you know, attempted bombings in schools, there's a lot of school districts that have had to deal with that. And the advice that the psychologists that give throughout is being honest with your children, but not creating anxiety that, yes, this is a virus, but let's talk about how it's spread. These are the things that you can do while you're at school to be aware, to keep yourself safe. So even, you know, telling your children not to leave the parking area when you're picking them up after school feels like second nature to all of us, right? We, we tell you, don't wander off. I need to pick you up. You need to be at, at tennis practice practice or soccer practice you and not be you know 25 yards away well there's some things with COVID again not being overly anxious and maybe save your anxiety conversation when the ears aren't listening and you can have it with your friends but keep the, the pragmatics with the children yes you're going to wear your mask if your mask feels like it's not gone no you need to wash your hands if you accidentally touch someone or something or accidentally take someone's pencil let's just be smart about this. There's not a large amount of data suggesting that transmission actually comes off of just being very aware of what they do in terms of concerns. But the biggest thing I like to highlight, incredibly low, incredibly low. it's far lower than most of the other issues that we've seen with Z state. We've had being able just to say that you are far more likely to catch the common cold from your friends than anything else. And I think when we can put it in that kind of um, frame of reference, it does help to about the common cold. Very good. All right. The next question that we have is, um, what are the signs that a person is experiencing um, a lot of stress? I'm sorry, you just broke up on me. Say it again. No worries. The next question is, what are the signs that a person is experiencing a lot of stress?
So that one is much more straightforward. So whether it's an adolescent, whether it's a, a, an adult, I think what we start seeing is changes. If you start seeing changes in behavior, changes in communication style, um, we often see either oversleeping or undersleeping. We will typically see people engaging in habits that are not healthy. Overeating can become significant or even not eating. Um, also changing in alcohol use can become significant. So what I always say, it's not about too much or too little, it's change. Whatever they're doing when they do significantly more of or less of it, that's when things become worrisome. And so being really well aware of the people that you love and you care about to look at if there's been a shift. The one I look for in adolescents is more isolation. I know they want to be in the room with their friends alone on the phone. I get it. I totally understand that. But are they doing it more? And are you noticing that maybe they aren't talking to their friends anymore? Maybe they're just in their room, but you're noticing your, your use of, of messaging time, of airtime on their phone has gone way down. That's going to be a worry for me. Why are they not connecting with their friends as much anymore? So really monitoring shifts in behavior. The other one to look for is irritability. The more stress you have, the less sleep you have, the more irritable you are. And for us as parents, I always say, take that gut check as soon as the kids walk in the door or you walk in the door, do the deep breath and say, I'm not going to bring my stress to this dinner table. You know, I'm going to have a great conversation where I talk, how was your school? And even if they didn't do their homework and even if they got an F on an assignment, I'm not going to blow up. I'm going to say, why did you get the F? What do we need to do to fix it? And let the child talk. Maybe there was a misunderstanding about an assignment, but then put the responsibility back on them. What can you do to fix it? Even a third grader can say, I'm going to call my teacher or text my teacher. They've all learned how to do it. And I'm going to ask them if I can check the assignment again. And so really working through more of a problem solving behavior than an angry behavior. And so the more we can be focused on staying in the present and not letting our anxiety get to us, and then once the family time is over, sitting down and thinking through, what am I telling myself that's making me feel this way? And is this really based on all the information or just on some of the information? And is it helping me to feel this much anxiety or can I do something different so that I can feel differently? Great segue into um, the last question, which is um, what can a person do to either avoid the stress triggers or to reduce the stress that they are experiencing? And I think you started to answer that um, at the end of your last response. Exactly, exactly. So you're, you're exactly right. So I think some of the things that we can do are what we know of. We can you know, pay attention to our habits, make sure we're not engaging in unhealthy habits. And in addition to watching our caffeine use, which I mentioned, the other one I wanna strongly suggest is exercise. And I know there's probably gonna be a lot of groans out there over that one, but you know, they talk about getting our heartbeat up over 140 beats per minute. And they talk about the idea of that we need to focus on the, the you know, exercising to help ourselves, that we need to focus on thinking about things that we would like, whether it be running or walking, but again, heartbeat over 140 beats per minute. And that we will you know, do things every day as much as possible, an hour a day, I know that's terrible, not 30 minutes, but an hour a day, and that we are going to do things that are going to be rewarding for us and helpful for us, so not trying to take on running a marathon if we've never run before, um, without kind of building up to it, with the idea being that the more we exercise, guess what, we sleep better, and then we have more energy to do what we need to do during the day the next day, and we actually get more done, so people say, I don't have time, well, we do. And I know people say, well, I've got my kids and we're home all the time. There are so many free YouTube videos on all different kinds of exercise that we can do. And in addition to that, people say, well, I don't have the space in my house. There's a wonderful video of a man who ran an entire marathon on a tiny New York City balcony by just going back and forth. I think it was five steps he could take each direction. So just, you know, thinking, is it really impossible? You know, can I do some body weight exercises in order to stay unstressed? And then finally, again, I'm going to go with that same thing of in the evening, do an evidence for and against. Whatever I'm telling myself, what am I telling myself? Because remember, feelings don't just happen. Feelings come from thoughts, right? And sometimes I'll even have parents watch that wonderful movie Inside Out, which had a great depiction of how memories work and feelings work. Feelings come from thoughts. 
So you can't just say, I'm just feeling anxious today. I'm just feeling mad today. No, you're telling yourself something that's making you feel that way. And that's really important to figure out what it is. That is great. We are still experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, we got a lot of what you were sharing with us, Dr. Shard. We greatly appreciate it. I know that these techniques are very helpful for both the parents and the students. So um, we're going to let you have um, one more segment to go ahead and share anything else that you would like to share with us in the Princeton community. And then we're going to wrap this up and we'll have to bring you back we can get the technology perfect so we can get all this and additional information from you. So the floor is yours, Dr. Shard. Thank you so much. And I apologize if any of that is on my end. I thought I was in a Wi-Fi area, but I may not have been. So I uh, please forgive me. And I would love to come back when we can be on a, a full Zoom call and talking about all of this. So um, just some final thoughts is be patient with yourself. You know, don't don't be too demanding of ourselves. You know, I've already mentioned, you know, being being more gentle on our children, but also give yourself a little bit of credit. We've had a year of a pandemic and that's a lot to deal with. So just being a little bit, you know, understanding of, you know what, I am a little bit stressed today and I do want a hot bath or I do need to take a walk when my, you know, significant other or friends are around just doing what we need to do to take care of ourselves because we're getting close folks. We're doing what we need to do, um, but we're just not there yet. So I, I appreciate you all listening and I'd love to come back another time. Well, thank you very much. We do greatly appreciate it. We appreciate everyone joining us for the Q&A and the education series. Uh, we want to make sure that as a district, we're uh, communicating with our community. Uh, again, not just our students and parents, but our entire community so that everyone knows what's going on and that everyone can benefit from these great minds that we have. Tonight, it was Dr. Shard sharing some great ways of dealing with COVID, dealing with stress, dealing with the issues that we're dealing with as a community because we are a Princeton community. And that being said, as a Princeton community, you know how we end every one of our episodes. And I'll say it and you can say it with me. Until next time, go Vox. Thanks everyone. <laughs>